Did you ever come across police corruption in your time? Oh yeah, yeah, no doubt about it. I mean, there was a lot of it in the old days, and I should imagine there's still some of it now. I remember back in the 80s, I robbed, um, me and my pal robbed the building society, split up the money. I'm on the way home with mine, it's in a hold -all. I get stopped by two fine squad who recognise me, search the bag, see the money, went, what are you doing with this? So I said, I was going to bring it to the police station, land it in. He said, that's all right, we'll land it in. There were nothing else from four and a half grand they could play with. <laughs> so I couldn't say nothing. Inside of a few of the uh, well known Essex criminals? Yeah, yeah, I mean, back in the 90s, um, Pat Tate, I've always got on with Pat, I thought he was a nice geezer. I used to, uh, we had a little bit of a business in HMP Albany when it was a dispersal on the Isle of Wight. We used to do cards, me and my pal. He used to do the drawings and I used to write the, write the poems. And it was things like, uh, you know, you could send them to people who grasped you up and there'd be a little hanging man on the front or something, you know what I mean? Pat used to buy a lot of them to send to people in Essex. <laughs> and I always got on great with Pat. I always found him to be a perfect gentleman. I know a lot of people said that he was a bully and this and that. And maybe he was, but that was never the face that I ever seen. And to be honest with you, I was quite gutted when I found out he was dead, to be honest. In the cells in Albany, they're quite small. So when Pat used to come into my cell, he had to duck his head down and the door to get in. He filled up a cell, you know what I mean? He, just, he had a lot of charisma, Pat. He was one of them geezers. When he was there, you knew he was there, you know what I mean? The presence around. Yeah, he had a little guy with him as well, and I never remember his name, but he was from Southern as well. We used to call him Bam Bam. He was an hairdresser, uh, like a really good barber, and he had this mad like bunch of hair on his head. And he was even robbing a security van or something. But he was like, him and Pat used to knock that thing out. I was thinking of the boat from Southend. Welcome to another Liquid Bullet Productions. Uh, back here again in sunny South End. Joining us today is Noel Smith, aka Razor. Thanks How for you doing? coming. Nice to meet you. So have you ever been down this way before to South End? Yeah, funny enough, I think I'm uh, I'm still barred out of South You're End. Still barred? Yeah, <laughs> as far as I know. Back in the 70s, I was a teddy boy. We used yeah. to come down to the bank holiday money down to Curzel and uh, fight with the skinheads and the mods and uh, whoever happened to want to fight. And uh, what the police used to do in South End, they'd get us all together because there'd be like about 20 of us and they'd take our boots. We all had steel toe cap boots on, so they'd make us take the boots off and then they march us out of town, following us with a van in a police van with all our boots. And when we got like beyond the boundaries of South End, they give us the boots back and tell us to piss off. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, she's so walking barefoot yeah, through, the, through yeah, the town. Yeah, sometimes in the rain and everything. They used to do that quite regularly down there. Yeah, I remember a lot of the bank holiday weekends. It was packed down there, all them mm. punks, skinheads, mods, yeah. crazy yeah. days. Good days. So, uh, a former notorious bank robber in your day. So they say. <laughs> how did that first start out, Razor? Uh, how did I first get into robbery? You know, how did you first get into the crime? Or what sort of age did that start with you? Well, I kind of got into it by accident. I think, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of a bit of a well-known story now, I think. But I, what it was, when I was 14, I was bunking school. I didn't like my secondary school, uh, Tulsa Secondary Model. It's been pulled down now. It was a, a terrible school, to be honest with you. A lot of fighting. I mean, I had more fights in that school than I ever had in outside the school. And uh, I used to play truant. So me and my pal, we used to get a mark and piss off down. We'd either go down Kensington to the museums if it was cold, because it was free to get in in those days. Or we'd just mooch around the streets if it was all right. We'd, you know, just like messing about. We were just schoolboys. And we were up in a place called Gypsy Hill in South London uh, one day. 
and um, a van pulled up, an old comma van, and about six geezers jumped out of it, all big lumps, grabbed hold of us, dragged us into the van, they stunk a drink, and they started beating the shit out of us in the back of the van. Uh, one of them grabbed hold of my finger, twisted it till it snapped, I became unconscious. They brought me round, they beat me power up at the same time, brought me round in the van and someone said, break his other finger. So they grabbed hold of this end and that was it for me. I was, you know, I was really, uh, I was 14 years old. So what they done was, they were a burglary squad who were quite well known round there they, for fitting people up and whatever. We were kids, we didn't know, we hadn't done any burglaries. They brought us back to the police station Gypsy or police station. And the thing that really frightened me was they took us in through the front entry, two 14 year old kids in school uniform, beating us as they went, we were screaming. And all the women who were in the typing pool and that didn't even look up, they just carried on typing, they dragged us through and um, said we were burglars and got us to, they opened the books, got us to admit the 60 odd burglaries, which we hadn't committed. Uh, but we were willing, you know, at that point, I, I was willing to tell them anything, you know. Just wanted to get out, pretty scared, so yeah, what's going on? Yeah, we sank the Titanic, we started World War II, we were, like, just coughing up everything. Um, and eventually, we got the call, my mum came up to pick us up from the station, and I had my broken finger and a lot of bruises all around my face, and I was so with my pal. And she went screaming back in the police station and said, why is he injured? And the old bill said, when we came across them, they were committing a burglary. And they were up climbing into a window up on a wall. And when we shouted, please stop, uh, he fell off the wall and that's how he broke his finger. So eventually what happened was we got the juvenile call and the magistrate refused to believe that we'd done it after we told our story and ordered a, an investigation into why we'd been nicked and advised us to take out a case against the police. And that was how I got into crime really because taking out a case against the police in those days, it took years. You know, we was kids in South London, we didn't have a penny. And um, the police had been suspended and they started beating me up every time they see me, dragging me into a car, twisting me sideburns, pulling me ears, pulling me nose, poking me in the eye. All silly, like, irritating That's things. That's crazy, like fully grown men, just yeah. bringing on kids. Yeah. Because their mates had been suspended, they wanted us to drop the charges. So every time they got me in the car, they'd say, drop the fucking charges or whatever, you know, drop this investigation. I couldn't. A brief was doing it. I didn't know how to do anything yeah, like that. Right, yeah. But um, because of that, I decided to move out of my mum's house, my mum and dad's house, at the age of 14, and started living in a derelict car on the estate because I didn't want to bring the police to their house. They kept yeah. coming up looking for stuff that we hadn't stolen. So I thought, my old man was, uh, he was a bit of a street fighter and a, a little bit of a villain, and uh, he never wanted the police around the door. So I thought, right, I won't bring them. I'll move somewhere else. And then I spent that summer, 1976, uh, really stealing motorbikes. I learned from a geezer on another estate. It was a rockery. He had a motorbike, took me out of Hot Warren. And I became involved in, I suppose, um, a war of attrition against the police. I used to, I'd steal motorbikes, middle of the night. I had no, um, no boundaries, no rules. I was living in a car. So I would steal a motorbike, hot wire it go out without a crash on them, drive around the streets of South London looking for old Bill. And when I see a police car, I'd pull up alongside them, kick the police car, give them plenty of that, and uh, get them to chase me. And that was my bit of fun, And because uh, I knew all the streets, I'd get away. Um, and then my next step up, when they got hold of my brother and started beating my brother up as well, my next step was to uh, steal their own bikes from the back of the police stations, and then ride around South London taunting them, and then one of them, I dumped his bike in a Honda 380 or something. Dumped his bike in Clanton Common Pond after I thrashed it. And, um, you know, they just wanted to get me and it just became a war of attrition. And eventually they did get me. They got me for stealing motorbikes and uh, obviously driving offences. And I ended up in Send Detention Centre, which was um, back in those days, it was an official government sanction. It was called the Short Sharp Shock. And the idea behind that, was that they would get juveniles under the age of 16 and if they committed their first offence, get them all together in a, in a camp like Send, which was in Surrey, and then uh, shave your heads and, and beat the life out of you, humiliate you, bash you all the time you was there. And they, what they wanted was kids to go, that was really bad, I'm never going back to crime. But it had the opposite effect. Yeah. They beat the shit out of us, they really did, and humiliated us. And um, But we all kind of banded together. Where I'd been on my own, 
like in South London, fight me war against the police. Suddenly, I'm in with geezers from Essex, from you know, from fucking uh, the other sides of London, Enfield, and people from North London, East London, and we're all together. And where we all thought we were single entities, suddenly we realise, you know, there's a furnace, yeah. So we became embittered by the system we were in. And what we wanted at that age was our own back. We were immature. We, you know, we're getting stick all the time. For what we, One guy was in, I remember, for, for actually stealing a Mars bar. And he got his head battered off him every day, you know, it was mental. Um, so we all kind of banded together in secret and like made contacts for the outside world. And I met a guy in there, his brother. We all, oh, the, the thing about it was, now we're all criminals. We're all identified as criminals. We're all in an incarceration. We're being treated like scum. So now we've taken on the criminal mindset, which is really easy to do when you're in prison. So as we all went in as first offenders, suddenly we're looking around and we're talking to each other. And we're, when we're talking to each other, the big thing that's coming out is armed robbery is the thing to do. Everyone wants to be an armed robber. Don't forget, in those times in the 70s, we grew up with television programmes like uh, Robin Hood. Robin Hood weren't nothing but an armed robber with his little firm in the forest, you know what I mean? Uh, uh, Jesse James was on the telly. There was all that sort of stuff. There was the great train robbers, John McVigger. So we all see armed robbery as the way forward if we wanted to sort of grow up in crime. So I met a guy there from North London whose brother had some firearms that he was willing to sell and I met up when I got out and I bought a single barrel Stephen shotgun, 1916 it was, and um, no ammunition with it, and a Luger pistol with a bent barrel, it couldn't be fired and it didn't have a magazine. But I, we weren't there, you know, we didn't want to shoot anybody, yeah, what just we wanted was shot. guns for armed robbery. So we went out and committed our first armed robbery, me and a mate of mine and a gypsy fellow I knew who was the driver. And um, we bought the record shop in Streatham, and it was really, it was ridiculous to be honest with you. What, what age was you there? I was 15. 15? Oh. But like the plans, because we'd only seen armed robberies on TV, so our plans that we made before the robbery were just too sophisticated. We bought a bag, we had overcoats on, it was the middle of summer, it was the summer of 76. We had overcoats, ski masks in our pockets. The driver sitting outside in a stolen court team had a, had a stocking mask on. And we're sitting there with the engine running. People was walking by going, Jesus Christ, <laughs> in a Mark 1 Cortina. And we're in, um, we've gone into the shop, we've got a bag, and in the bag we've got pliers to cut the phone line, we've got rope to tie them up, we've got the two guns, we've got a knife just in case. We've got all sorts of mad shit. And we go in there, this is our first robbery, and we go up to the back of the shop, there's two people in there, and we go up and we start pretending to look for the records. So in this particular shop, I'd been in there before, and the record player was under the counter. So if you wanted a record player that played, he had to go under the counter. Yeah. So we've waited till the gears has gone. We're sweating, like in these hats and huge coats and bags and rovers. And uh, we've waited till the other gears has gone and I've picked up a record. I always remember what it was as well. It was, it was a thing called uh, 20 Heartbreakers in LP. Roy Orbison was on it. So I've gone up to the counter and I've gone to the geezer, sweat pouring off me. I want you play this, mate. You remember what track? I went track six, Roy Orbison. So he's gone under the counter. When he's gone under the counter, we've looked at each other and I've gone like that to pull the Luger out and it's caught on the lining of my coat. I've got this big overcoat on and it's caught on the lining of the coat. The barrel's bent, so it's caught. So as I've pulled it out, I've, I've pulled it out and there's a bit of the lining is stuck to the barrel and it's a red bit of lining. And I've stuck it out like that and it looks like one of them guns where you fire bang and a little thing comes out. <laughs> so he starts laughing, the geezer. So he starts laughing. When he comes up on me like that, with a thing hanging up my gun. And he went, <laughs> and I went, stand and deliver. It's the only thing I could think to say. <laughs> stand and deliver, I will shoot you. And my mate's getting the shotgun out and he's got it out as well. And I've gone, right, so now we're, we're like calm. So I've gone, right, open the till, give us all the money. So he's got his hands up. So put your hands down. So he's opened the till and he's pulled out a tenner. So he's put the 10 pound note on the counter. I said, and the rest, he went, that's the lot. He said, we took the money at the bank at three o'clock. So I've looked at my mate, me, Peter, he's dead now. I've looked at Peter, Peter's looked at me, I'm like, what should we do? And Peter went, tie him up. So, so I snatched the tenner, and I thought, well, I'm not staying here to fucking tie him up. So I've gone to the geezer. On the spur of the moment, I've gone, right, look out your window. I said, see that roof over there? And there was a supermarket across the road. So he's gone, yeah, by now he's shitting himself. So we've got a sniper up on that roof. Sniper. <laughs> sniper up on that roof, and if you leave this place in 10 minutes, he's going to shoot you. 
where's your phone? He said, I ain't got a phone. <laughs> We've took the tenner, and as we're going out, there's a rack by the side of the door, and I've grabbed about 20 LPs. The car's gunning away. We run out, jumped in, shot off like a bat out of hell. And I ended up with 20 copies of the Bay City Rollers Greatest Hits LP, which I give to my sister and her mates on the estate. And, and a tenner. Now, you might think to yourself, right, three geezers, done their first arm robbery and get a tenner. Three quid each. You know, that, that's, like, that's going to put you off for life. And it did put George off, who was the driver. He went, I'm not doing all this for three quid. But me, I got the buzz. And the buzz was, when I went into that shop and I pulled that gun out, I was suddenly in control. I had, for once, people were listening to me. Don't forget, I was a skinny little kid. I'd been in DC. They'd been battering the shit out of me. Grown men in uniform. Police had battered me. Now, all of a sudden, I'm in charge. So that, that gave me a right buzz. It gave me a right G up. And I, I couldn't wait to do another one. So we went and found another driver. And sure enough, we went at it hard. We used to do rent offices. In the old days, on the estate, there was always an office you'd go down and pay your rent. So they had a safe in there with a rent in there. So we'd done a few of them. We'd done uh, quite a lot of shops. Um, and like through the summer, we was like robbing. And I was getting nicked for other things as well. I was getting nicked for like nicking motorbikes. Because now I'm right, I'm deep into criminality. So I, they put me in Stanford House, which was a juvenile remand centre in Shepherd's Bush. And um, at the age of 15. So Stanford House was like, it was like a juvenile prison. Um, it's on Goldhawk Road in Shepherd's Bush. I don't know if it's still there. But it had a huge yard and like dormitories, houses, like there was Ham V, O'Hare, church. I was in church, yeah, which was a red t shirt. You all had a uniform. Church was red t shirt, blue jeans, black slip on, plimsolls. Ham V was yellow, O'Hare was blue. Just so they could separate. Like, yeah. So you have, apart yeah. from what bit you're in. So the first day I go in there, in the Stanford House, I've seen all the escape films. I'm gone, mate. You know, I mean, this is, for me, this is where I'm going. So I've got into Stanford House, they've run me through reception, walking me over to uh, the actual dormitories, and I've looked, and the fence was, uh, the fence was 18 foot high, but it was chicken, not chicken wire, but like chain link fence, quite high, and barbed wire on the top, and it curved over. So if you climbed up, you had to climb over it as well. So there's about four of us walking to the dormitories with this screw. And I just looked up, I thought, oh, I could do that, mate. I was fit, you know what I mean? I was 15. So I just broke away, legged it to the fence, up, up out over the fence. They're all shouting and screaming, get down off the fence, boom, over the other side, and I'm gone. Right down Gold Oak Road, jumped in the tube, gone. So they catch me about three days later. So they take me back to Stanford House. What a mistake. <laughs> get me into Stanford House. I'll get as far as the dormitories now. And... Um, they said, we've got to keep a special watch on you. And what they used to do in Stanford House, and I've never seen it done anywhere else, and the geezers who've done it would, should be a fucking shame of themselves. They used to pick out certain prisoners who were good runners and who were quite, you know, well-built. And they'd say, right, if you catch a runner, you get 50p. Now, the, the wages was 50 pence a week in Stanford House. So if you caught anyone who tried to run away, you'd get 50 pence. Yeah. These geezers were like bounty hunters. They were fellow prisoners. Yeah. So one day, the next day, I'm over in... They sent me over to education. And the education block is right at the front of the prison. But there's a double door in between the offices and the education department. So I'm in the education department. And what they had us doing over there was making um, making ashtrays out of tin with toffee hammers. You know, right, shaping yeah. tin and brass into ashtrays. Um, so I'm over there and, and I've come out for a smoke in the actual education block. And me and another geezer are standing there. And I've looked at these doors, and I went, where do these doors lead to? And I pulled it, and because they were bolted on the other side, when I pulled it, they opened the two double doors. And as we looked through, all the offices were there, and all the clerical staff, and right down here, you can see the entrance to the offices in Gold Road. Right. I've looked at this other guy, he's looking at me, we've gone, whoa, so we leg it through. <laughs> but one of the, one of the bounty hunters has seen us, he's in the education department, so he started chasing us. We ran straight through the offices, they were going, oh, what's going on here? We've legged it through, come out the front entrance, out on the Golden Road, pegging it down the road, and the chase is still on. It's still coming for you. Yeah. <laughs> so we've got about halfway oh, down Golden Road, and this geezer's right next to me, the other fellow who's escaping with me, I can't remember his name. And he went, we've got, we've got a bounty hunter on us. So we've both stopped and turned around, and this geezer's come running up to us, and he's like, standing there breathing hard. And we went, yeah. 
and he's looked back and he went, fuck it, I'm going home as well. And he <laughs> ran off and, and, and went home as well. Yeah, so we all escaped. So I got caught again a week later and they took me back to Stanford House. And the funny thing was, they went, because of your escape history, you're only allowed to wear pyjamas. Like, we ain't giving you no uniform. You have to wear pyjamas all the time. So if you escape, people will spot Stick you easier. Yeah. So I went, all right. And I thought, I'm escaping. And uh, I remember, a couple of nights later, they had a telly room in the centre. And a film was on called A Shot in the Dark, Inspector Cluso. A really funny film in those days. So they brought us over from the house block and we're in this, this uh, room where the telly is. And there's about, I don't know, 50 kids and about three screws. So we're in there, and I'm halfway through. I've put my hand up, and one of the screws went, what? I said, I've got to use a toilet, and the toilet's in the house block, so it's like, I'd say, a 20-foot walk through the open to get to the house block. So the screw said, right, I'm watching you. So he comes over to the door. I've gone in to go to the toilet. When I've come out, instead of watching me, he's laughing his head off at the film. He's looking back into the film. So I think, right, boom, out, over the fence, gone. Got down a gold old road, and I'm thinking, what can I do? So I'm in a shop doorway in my pyjamas, at, waiting at the bus stop and there's a, a young geezer he must have been about 19 with his bird and they're laughing so he comes over to me and I've got this story already made up in me and yeah I was at a party you threw me clothes in the swimming pool and like I've had to wear these to get home <laughs> so they come up to him the geezer went to me nice clothes so he, he's a lot older than me I'm looking at him I'm thinking did you get a copper or something so I went, yeah, I was at a party. He went, save it, mate. He said, they're Stanford House pyjamas. <laughs> like, and he went, my brother's in Stanford House. He said, do you know him? And I went, yeah, yeah. I didn't even know what his name was. I went, yeah, yeah, I know you, brother. So he went, yeah. And he gave me a pound. And he went, get yourself home and get chased. Jumped on the bus, could pay the fare, went home, got chased. So I was forever getting nicked during that summer in Stanford House. They tried everything to keep me in there, but they couldn't. And eventually, uh, I got nicked in the end of 1976 for two armed robberies. Did, uh, sorry, just to step in there. Did they, um, when you was getting caught for keep escaping, did they like, did they have any sort of punishment for that or was it make it longer? Or? No, they had no punishment. What they did, they weren't expecting people to escape, yeah. really. But because you were juvenile and you hadn't been convicted yet, you were on remand, the only thing they had was a thing they used to call CP. It was originally corporal punishment, but what they turned it into was a, a, a confined cell where you'd be held in a unit. Uh, this was my next move, if it, the last time I escaped, if I hadn't been nicked for armed robbery. So they'd hold you in this unit, and they had like all the worst kids, like kids in a murder and all that in there, and all the escape risks. But I only made it into there for one day, and then I escaped again, uh, bringing a meal over one day. I'm bringing a trolley with two screws and I've deliberately steered it close to the fence and then when they weren't looking, jumped up on top of the trolley and up and over the fence again and gone. <laughs> so they couldn't hold me and I ended up, the kids around the estate knew I was always coming back, you know what I mean? So it was quite a funny time. But eventually, later that year, I got nicked for armed robbery and that, was, that changed the whole situation. We was nicked for armed robbery, me and a mate of mine, Peter, who's dead now, nicked for armed robbery on uh, the record shop and on... Uh, a sweet shop where Peter had actually um, the guy fought back and Peter broke a bottle of R White's lemonade over his head so we were nicked for GBH there two armed robberies possession of firearms and remanded into custody for the old baby for trial so I went into uh, Peter was older than me so he went to Ashford which was over 18s and I ended up in Latchmere House, which was a juvenile remand centre, and you could not escape from there. It was proper, you know, yeah. it was a proper prison. Um, and I stayed in there for about four months, and then we went up to the Old Bailey and um, for trial, and our brief come to us and said, look, if you plead guilty to one to two robberies, possession of firearms, then they'll take the GBH into account on me, but not on Peter. And he said, and uh, what will happen is, you'll go back to DC. I'd already been to DC for three months. And he said to Peter, you'll go back to Ballstall for a recall. We'd been to Ballstall. So we went, yeah, okay, then we'll do that then. You know what I mean? Because I'm thinking six months ain't bad. Peter's thinking I'll be out in 12 months. So we got up in front of the judge at the Old Bailey, court two, I think it was, and um, for sentencing. And when they explained it all to the judge, he went, this is not America. He said, we don't do deals in this country. He said, no. 
He said, uh, as you've pleaded guilty, he said, I'm going to give you what you deserve. And he said, you'll go to prison for three years. That was me. And said to me, mate, you'll go to prison for three years. You'll go to adult prison so and you will be. sort of lie to you there to yeah. get you into sort of like a false yeah. potential. But what I got, the sentence then, I don't want to be too technical, but the sentence was actually called a Section 53. It was a very, very rare sentence and still is to this day. And what it is, is from the Children and Young Persons Act 1933. Now the wording in it, well I had to learn this, you know what I mean? This was, the wording in the sentence in the, in the thing was this. If you're a juvenile under the age of 16 and you committed crimes that will warrant 14 years imprisonment or more in an adult, you could get this sentence. So the judge was basically saying, if you was an adult, I'd give you over 14 years for this. There's a section 53. And the difference with section 53 is you've got no remission, no remand time, you've done your sentence. Every year they would look at you for parole, but nobody ever got parole on section 53 sentences because you're, by definition, you're a dangerous little bastard. And the people, are, and another mate of mine got a free year, funny enough, Jerry Keeble from South End. He had robbed, he was a prolific burger, ger, burglar, Jerry, and it, he's dead now as well, he died about four years ago. But um, what had happened with him was he went and robbed a restaurant and he nicked 80 quid's worth of meat. Blimey. Right? But because he had 100 previous for burglary, they give him a section 53 straight away. So he got three years. So another mate of ours, Tony Woodbridge, who was 14, he got involved in a robbery with older geezers. Um, it was only a £60 robbery. Uh, but like someone was assaulted on the robbery. And the, the judge sent them, the older geezers to prison for 18 months. And because he was such a bad, he had bad previous, they said to Tony, you'll go to prison for seven years. They said, you get out when you're a man, when you're 21. That was the, what the judge, and it was on the front page of the Sun the next day. You've given seven years told, come out when you're a man, you know. So there's us three, all been on remand together, all got section 53 sentences, very rare sentences. So they sent us to a special unit in Ashford Prison. And it was right at the top, I think it was E-Wing. And in that unit, they had violent and recalcitrant juveniles who were serving long sentences, so section 53s. Uh, there was two murderers in there. There was one schoolboy who'd killed his mate. There was a 14-year-old who'd killed his grandmother, strangled her a Turk. Uh, there was, um, uh, what was his name? Pat, um, he got nicked for the IRA bombings. He never had nothing to do with them at all. But he got seven years, I think, Section 53. He was in there as well. He was one of the uh, family who was supposedly bomb-making it. It turned out they were all innocent in the end. But... Um, yeah, so we're in there, and then three rapists come in. They got done for a rape over in Shepherd's Bush. They raped some young girl in the park, and they all got nicked and got 10 and 12 years. They come in. They're all under 16. So, of course, we're battering them every chance we get. Every time the doors open, we're fighting. It's like a madhouse, this, this unit. Um, and we stayed in there for months. Um, and eventually, we all got shipped out. And I went to Dover, Ballstall. My mate Jerry went to uh, Rochester Postal and Tony ended up in Aylesbury, uh, young prisoners. So when, when I'm in Dover, I, I'm doing three years. I'm a 15-year-old kid. I've been battered senseless all around and, and I've committed armed robberies and I've seriously fucking hurt people. Now, I'm thinking to myself, this is my life. I am not fucking doing this sentence. I ain't doing it. Because they put me in a postal system and the difference being is if you're a postal boy, you would do six months to two years. The maximum they could hold you was two years and you had to be a right bastard for that. So most Borstal boys got out within nine months, right? So I'm doing like four lots of nine months. I'm doing four Borstal sentences. Oh, and, and I'm in with Borstal boys who are getting out all the time. And I'm thinking, I'm not doing it. So I started becoming a right problem for them. I tried to escape from Dover. And Dover, Borstal, Western Heights, it's on top of a cliff. And there's a moat around it, a dry moat. You can't swim across it. It's like about oh, 70 foot deep. Time. Yeah. So, like, it was supposed to be impossible to escape from, but I tried everything to escape from there. I really did. But then what happened was I started having a lot of fights with other inmates, and they called me down to the hospital one day because, don't forget, I'm a Section 53. This, these are rare, and people don't know how to handle you. And they've looked at me and went, he's a right horrible little bastard. Get him down to the hospital and see if he's got any mental problems. So... They've got me down in the hospital, and um, the doctor started giving me a load of abuse. I went, who the fuck are you talking to? One of the screws grabbed me. I punched him in the jaw. 
knocked them backwards, and they've all piled onto me, dragged me down, put me in a block, and it was an underground block, and it was all stone flags. You had a mattress on the floor that come in at eight o'clock, and your bed in, and that was it, no pillars, nothing. You had the clothes you stood up in, a piss pot, and every morning they'd open the door and push in a galvanised steel bucket with uh, a cloth, a scrubbing brush, and a bar of carbolic soap in it, and you oh, had to scrub the wash. floor. Oh, scrub the, the floor. floor. Stone flags. So the first day they put it in, I went, what's that for? He went to scrub the floor before breakfast. I went, I ain't scrubbing no floor. So the screw went, you will scrub the floor, you won't get breakfast. I said, stick the breakfast up your ass, mate, I'm not scrubbing no floor. So sure enough, they left it in there all day. So come about evening time, screws open the door with a PO, he said, you're going to scrub that floor? I said, no, I'm fucking not. And they went, right, take it out. So they took the bucket out, locked me up for night. Next morning it comes back in again, scrub the floor. So I thought, well, I've had enough of this. I've gone over, kicked the bucket over. So it's all over the floor. It's all flooded and it's going out under the cell door. Screws come down, you cheeky little fucker. So they've steamed right into me, dragged me out of that cell, beat the shit out of me, put me in another cell. So I thought, right, I'm not giving in to these people. So eventually, I get this idea that when the screws open the door, I'm going to steam straight into them. They ain't putting another bucket in my cell. Next morning, I'm going straight into them. Sure enough, I do, and I get battered. And they hold me down, and they call the doctor over, and eventually six screws hold me down. They inject me in the arse with uh, a sedative, and I woke up three days later in Rochester Ballstall, 25 miles away, in a, a padded cell in their hospital. So I woke up in this padded cell. I ain't got a clue where I am. And I'm looking around, and I'm thinking, what's happened? And the door opens, and a geezer, who's obviously a doctor in a white coat, comes to the door with a trolley, and there's another geezer with him, a screw. And he's gone, Smith, take this. And he's, give me a cup of medication. Now, what, what is it? He went, it's to counteract the effects of the injection. Fuck off. I said, I'm not taking nothing. Go away with me. They couldn't do nothing with me. I was just a kid. So in the end, I ended up ripping uh, a hole because I was in there for about fucking, I think it was three days. I ripped the hole in the padding. I managed to get on it. And I actually pulled all the padding out and spread it all over the cell. When they opened it the next time, it was all, uh, you know, oh, you get me, get me out of the cell, get me in another padded cell. They only had two padded cells. And I said, I'm just going to rip that one. And they went, we'll try. And they give me what they, give me what they call in prison a zoot suit, which is like... A t-shirt and a pair of shorts, but they're made out of unterrible material like nylon. Yeah. We, I oh, ripped them bits, mate. Took them off on there naked, trying to rip through the padded cell. So eventually they come to me, they send a, a, a PO in, and he was quite good. And he sat down and he went, listen, what's the problem here? I said, the problem is I go to sleep in fucking Dover. I wake up in Rochester. I'm in padded cells. There's nothing wrong with me. And he went, well, your behavior would suggest otherwise. So I said, he said, look. He said, what we're going to do is, he said, we're going to give you a series of medication here. I said, what's the medication? You don't need to know that. <laughs> he said, <laughs> but we're, you giving, then, yeah. Yeah, we're giving you an injection and you have to take the tablets every day to count of the injection. If you don't, and I said, well, what happens if I don't take the tablets? And he went, well, you'd be sorry. So, fuck off. So anyway, they've, they've given me this injection and it turns out it was Logactyl. So have you ever heard of Logactyl? No, yeah, it's, it's a bad, bad psychotropic drug they use in jail to subdue people. It's called the liquid kosh. And what it does, when, you, when you're on it, you do what they call the Largactyl shuffle, which is when you're walking, you're shaking, and you're walking about less than a mile an hour, but you think you're normal. So, And I'll tell you how bad it was. I had a mate in there that I knew outside in the hospital. I come across him in the hospital again, named Vince, a black guy who lived on my estate. And Vince was in there as well, and he's on like Lactal as well. So they let us out. They said, you can have an hour's association. So we're put into this big room, and there's an old black and white telly in there, and there's a table tennis table. So Vince says to me, do you want a game of table tennis? I said, yeah, all right. So he said, I'll get the ball. So he's gone. 20 minutes later, he comes back. We're both walking like that. So he says, I'll serve. So he throws the ball up. He goes like that, and the ball's all over on the floor over there. Right? So he's like, by the time he gets his arm up to hit the ball, the ball's already gone, like 10 foot away. So he says, I'll get it. And he goes to get the ball, and I'm standing there just looking into space, and then it comes, right, your hour's over. I'm like, what? <laughs> I mean, we can't believe it. We're both shuffling back to ourselves. So eventually what they do is, they come to me and they said, 
we're going to put you up on a wing. We've got a wing here that's just open, Sea Wing in Rochester. It had newly been built, I think, two years before. So they said, it's an escape-proof wing. It's for people like you. So we're going to keep you in there. I said, oh, fair enough then. Uh, if you cause any trouble, you're back in the hospital or in the block. I went, all right. Got up on this wing, met a few people I know. And, and it's, it, this wing is specifically built to be escape-proof. And I'm sitting there with a mate of mine one day. And they had a, 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 a craft room at the end of the spur. And in the craft room, you could make woodworking stuff or you could like sew soft toys or whatever. So there was some chisels in there. And uh, we're sitting there one day and my mate Saldi, he looked at the door and he went, you know, these cells ain't escape proof. I went, how'd you work that out? Because they had a strip of plastic that the screws could look in. They had a bolt outside and they had the lock. He said, take a look at the, the door jam. And the, the jam of the door was wooden and it was, it was a cup, for the, a steel cup for the lock to go into. So I said, what do you mean? He went, well, if you take that cup out, he said, where does the lock go? It don't go in. And if you cut the, the, the wood off, you can open the door yourself. So, so we've come up with an escape plan. So it's October. So we all decide that we're going to escape on Christmas Eve. The whole landing. There's about <laughs> 20 of us on this spur, yeah. So we're all in on it. And for weeks, people are gathering stuff, civilian clothes that they can get down at fucking... Uh, down at the recycle thing and like money, cash money, because you got paid in 10 pence pieces. Uh, car keys, someone had a bunch of FS car keys smuggled in so we could nick cars when we got out. And our plan was, simple one, after eight o'clock, nine o'clock at night, the night watchman comes on. All the screws go up, so you've got a night watchman on each wing and a parole, patrol, night patrol. So what we've done is, we said, right, I'll get out of my cell, right, because we've got it all worked out. I'll get out of my cell, I'll do the night watchman, get his keys and open up everywhere and we'll fuck off. This was the plan. Christmas Eve, my birthday, how could it go wrong? <laughs> so, sure enough, what I've done is, a couple of days before, I've cut the cup out of my lock. So now, when the lock is closed from the outside, I can actually see the bolt going in from this side. And if I pull, I can open the door. But there's a, a bolt outside as well, which they close. And I've got a strip thing, but it was screwed in. So we've what we've done was took all the screws out, so when the screw goes down there, I can take the strip out, coat hanger out, undo the bolt and then pull my door open. I'm out. Skate-proof fucking wing, they spent millions on it. <laughs>